morning and Wake Up West Coast. We are so excited to welcome you to our June edition of the Wake Up West Coast program. In fact, our last program of this cycle. So uh, what a great way to wrap up and start a wonderful summer season. I'm Jane Clark, I'm president of the West Coast Chamber. Happy to welcome everybody here in person, as well a very warm welcome to our digital attendees. We're glad you're with us today. Today's program sponsor is Spectrum Health, and we wanted to give an opportunity for you to learn a little bit more about Spectrum Health's occupational health program. And so in a few minutes, I'm going to interview uh, a representative from Spectrum Health. I also want to say a very big welcome to our, and thank you to our morning mingle sponsor, which was AAC Credit Union. We were happy to have the coffee back for you. I know you all missed that during the pandemic, but we're back with coffee and networking. So thank you, AAC Credit Union, for sponsoring our morning mingle today. So with me on stage is Dr. Christopher Brennan. Uh, Dr. Brennan spends about half of his time as a family physician and half of his time in an administrative role. And among other things, he is responsible for the occupational health programs of Spectrum Health. We're gonna learn a little bit more about an occupational health program now that's been launched at Zeeland Hospital. So Dr. Brenner, tell us a little bit about the new Zeeland Clinic. Yeah, good morning everybody. I, I wanted to say I, uh, I felt West Michigan this morning, so I was coming in from Grand Rapids, had to make that choice, go on the highway or go Chicago Drive. I did Chicago <laughs> Drive, got a couple tractors, I was back in the fray. <laughs> then I got to get on campus here at Hope and I'm like, I got to meet the mayor and now I'm getting to speak to you wonderful people. So it's so, we're so geeked to be in person again. This has really been a blessing and West Michigan is always a near and dear place to me. Um, what we wanna start out with is we have a new offering of our occupational health services. Instead of going to Grand Rapids, the reverse direction, most of us came today from Grand Rapids, you actually can go to 833 Felch, which is on the Zeeland campus. As you approach the building on the left side of the building, we, you're welcome to come and check it out. We had our grand opening not too long ago. But um, we're, welcome to, we're, wel we're welcoming with open arms and we're excited as I'll get out to serve West Michigan clients. That's awesome. So let's fill in the audience. What does occupational health services mean? What can they uh, yeah. have done at this clinic? Yeah, so this, 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 this part of medicine is dedicated to employers and the employees. And we would like to share some services that we do. Things we do, we do things like DOT physicals, we do audiograms for hearing, we do fit testing for respirators. We do things like pre-employment physicals. We also do surveillance for alcohol and drug screening. Probably the, the one that's probably the most exciting is the initial and follow-up from injuries. Real quickly, remember the initial and follow-up from injuries, we welcome walk-ins. And the time that you can be seen and out is so much quicker now that we're on campus. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, so as we wrap up, um, you're speaking to our audience, right? The services you're offering are the things that our businesses need. Uh, what is going to make your services stand out from the other choices they have as far as occupational health? We're pretty biased. We think we're the best. But what's really, <laughs> what's really interesting is we are an integrated health system. And what that means is you're not going to just go to a clinic and try to figure it out. You're going to be connected to a multifunctional system. So you have hospitals, clinics, also, we see uh, virtually, so you can do things at your practice, um, you can do things in your offices where we can see people do, doing things that way. Um, we like to think we're a one-stop shop where we have hospitals, clinics, and, and partnership with our, um, our payer priority health. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you for your sponsorship. Thank you for making the, the trek to the West Coast today. We hope you spend the rest of the day in Holland, do some shopping downtown, go out to eat, and uh, have a great day. Thank I you might, very much. I might hit New Holland, I'm just saying. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that was wonderful. Uh, I want to get you warmed up now to get your brains thinking about our topic today. So we're going to do some tabletop networking. And for our folks that are watching digitally, I hope you'll uh, participate through the chat feature. So one minute each around your table, you're going to share your name, your company, and how you get the most fulfillment at work. So name, company, what brings you the most fulfillment at work? Ready, set, go. We'll be back in a few minutes.
I hope you've made some great connections at your table today. We love hearing the networking going on, and uh, this is just a reminder after today's event, you do not need to hurry when you leave today. As you're making connections, continue these conversations. The room is available. Certainly there's a coffee shop down the hall, so we encourage you to continue to meet your fellow chamber members. But it's my privilege now to introduce today's keynote speaker. We're welcoming today Dr. Tracy Brower. She has her PhD in sociology, studying work, life, fulfillment, and happiness. She's author of two books, The Secret to Happiness at Work and Bring Work to Life. Tracy's also the Vice President of Worksite Insights for Steelcase, and I frequently see her work on Forbes.com. And in fact, her work has been translated into 17 languages. So it's a real treat to welcome Dr. Tracy Brower. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for having me. Is the sound OK? Yeah? Okay, awesome. I'm so excited to be here with you. I have been speaking nationally, internationally, and here we are home together in what I think is one of the absolute, absolutely best places to live in the world. So really, really thrilled to be with you all. All right, so let's talk about happiness. They say that whatever you choose to study in school, make sure you like it because you will be spending a lot of time talking about it. And I gotta tell you, I drew the long straw on this because there is no better time to talk about happiness and joy and fulfillment in work. I was actually um, talking to a journalist, he was interviewing me um, and uh, said, you know, Tracy, are you a little tone deaf? Like, is this really the time to talk about joy and happiness? And I said, Absolutely, because when things are upside down and inside out, there is no better time to reset and reimagine and rethink and re-energize. So here we are talking about the right kind of topic. And you all, I've got a gift of happiness for you. As you leave, you can um, grab one of the books that's on the table out there. So this is going to be a really important reinvention of work and the most important reinvention of work any of us will experience. It may be different industry by industry, region by region, job by job, but in general, as a society globally, we are thinking more consciously with more awareness than ever before about what we do, why we do it, with whom, for whom we work, why we work, and all of those things are driving new kinds of requirements for the kinds of work that we do that gives us fulfillment, which is what you all just had a chance to talk about. So this is our moment as employees to think about what are we doing, even if we're employed by ourselves, um, and it's our moment as leaders to create the conditions for amazing, happy work. So it's a great moment to be doing what we all are doing. And we are very much in the midst of a talent revolution. The best economists you talk to will say that this talent revolution, this shortage of talent, will not abate, even if we go through a contraction that's very significant in the economy. So that's super interesting. The other thing that's important to us is that there's this dynamic called Zoom towns. Has, has anybody heard about Zoom towns? I love this term, right? It hasn't yet, yet caught on, apparently, but Zoom towns are the dynamic that is occurring when people leave major markets and they come to mid markets because they can. Because they can work on Zoom, they can work remotely. And so they choose to live in places like Holland or Grand Haven or Grand Rapids or Spring Lake or you fill in the blank because they can. And that is important to us because we can attract people. It's also important to us because of the competition, right? All of a sudden, we're competing with more people in more places and more companies. I was leading a CEO CHRO forum recently, and they said, when we place an ad, we don't get any applicants. It's not that we get the wrong applicants or underqualified applicants or non-aligned qualifications. It's that we get nobody. That's incredible. And I love this quote from the CHRO. She said, nothing we've ever done in the past is working today. So the reason this matters to us is that when we create the conditions for joy and happiness for ourselves and for our organizations, we can attract and retain more effectively and we can compete for talent more effectively. 
Uh, so we have a wonderful opportunity in front of us. So what does it mean to be happy at work? One of the things that is absolutely a myth of happiness is that if we're doing it right, we are happy all the time. It's bonbons and butterflies and I don't have any bad days. And that's absolutely not true. We will 100% have ebbs and flows. Sometimes we will have great days. Other days, not so much. Sometimes in some seasons of life, it'll be easier to juggle it all, and sometimes not so much. And so one of the things we can do is take the pressure off of ourselves to feel like we should always be happy all the time. And what does it mean anyway? When we are really fulfilled in our work, we tend to feel a few things. We tend to feel super dedicated. Like, I want to read that extra article. We were just talking at our table, actually, and Bethany said, you know, like, I hope I sh it's okay to share this example. She said, yeah, you know, sometimes at night I'm, like, reading work-oriented stuff, and my husband says, sorry, you really weren't planning on this example. <laughs> Bethany's really happy right now that she made the mistake of sitting next to me. You know, my husband will say, honey, are you working? And I say, huh, probably, but I like what I'm doing, right? Like, that is a great example of dedication. The other thing that tends to happen when we're um, happy at work, joyful at work, is immersion. Like, we just feel in a really good way, immersed in what we're doing. It occupies lots of our thoughts in a good way. And we tend to feel a level of vigor. I love this idea. This is about energy. This is about you feel energized to contribute your energy. This is about you feel a level of energy coming back at you because you're making a difference and you want to expend energy. So it's a reciprocity of energy. And meaning is fundamental. When we have a sense that what we do matters, that absolutely makes a huge difference. And we'll talk about how to create more of that. And the thing to remember, again, is that there's no constancy. You'll have days where you feel utterly energized, and you'll have days when you don't. Here's another myth of joy and happiness at work, and that is the myth of choice. We also, in our North American uh, society and in our Western culture, we tend to believe that if we make the right choices about work, we shall always be happy. So if I choose the right job, I'll always be happy. Or if I choose the right partner or the place to live, right? If I make the right choices in life, I shall be happy. The truth is that every choice we make comes with a set of conditions. There'll be things we love about it and things that we don't, right? Like if we're really honest, we may have chosen a partner that we adore, but there may be a couple things that annoy us now and then with that person, right? Or we might have a job we love, but, oh, expense reports. So when we can think about choices and as much alignment as possible, that also contributes to joy and happiness. When we think about what do we love to do, what do we have to do, and when those are as aligned as possible in the classic kind of Venn diagram, circles that overlap, that is a really good situation. And here's the other thing to know about joy and happiness. We tend to have a silver platter myth of joy. Like when all the conditions are right, we shall be happy. When I get through this really tough project, when I'm done working this really tough customer, oh, when I get that next job, or when that leader moves on that I have to work with, right? Those external conditions, we can say to ourselves, I will be happy when those external conditions are right. The truth is that we are utterly empowered to create the conditions for happiness. So we don't have to wait like a silver platter comes to us and all the conditions are right. We can absolutely create those conditions ourselves. Is this making sense? All right, way cool. Here's one of the other really important things about happiness, and that is the happiness paradox. I am, I'm so energized by research and science and all of the ways that we understand ourselves as people. And happiness has been extraordinarily researched. So I've, I've fallen into this, like, I don't know, this, uh, this lake of wonderfulness in terms of the research. And one of the things we know is that if you pursue happiness for its own sake, you'll be less likely to feel happy because you tend to be pursuing something, and that reminds you of what you don't have. Otherwise, why would you be pursuing it? And it tends to be all about you. And that is negatively correlated with happiness. Positively correlated with happiness is when we reach out, when we contribute, when we um, 
give our gifts in lots of different ways to our communities. And so what we can do instead of pursuing happiness for its own sake is create the conditions for happiness. And I promise we'll talk about that. And there are lots of business benefits, right? So this is the moment when good business leaders say, yes, but Tracy, this is very fluffy. Can you get down to business, please? And this is the moment when I say, oh my gosh, when people are happier, they're more likely to stick with your organization. They make bigger goals. They're more likely to reach them. They perform better. They make better decisions. They're more likable. So that contributes to a constructive culture. And this operates at the country level as well. When countries' citizens are happier, they tend to have greater GDP, greater physical health, and greater economic success. So happiness is worth it. All right, so this is the exciting polling part of the process, right? You don't have to get out your phones. We're not going to do this digitally. We're going to do this the old-fashioned way. Do you remember, like, sitting in class and you would vote, right? So this is, that's the way this is going to go. It's going to be very exciting. So I'm going to read you the question, and then I'm going to come back and go through them and ask you to vote. To what extent has your happiness at work changed in the last couple years? A, my happiness at work has increased. B, there have been some ups and downs, but overall, my happiness has pretty much stayed the same. C, my happiness at work has declined. Or D, the jury is still out on this one. All right, happiness at work. How many of you increased? Any hands? Wow, we are the happiest city in the world. That's like, <laughs> that's like 65 66% of you. All right, B, any ups and downs, people? Oh, that's another for sure 29%. How about C, my happiness at work has declined? Anybody? Okay, good, good, good. A few people who are, uh, who are brutally honest. That's super important, right? Like you need to understand and reflect on where you're at. Anybody jury still out and you're thinking about it? All right. Thank you, you all. So this is important, right? Because when we reflect and understand where we're at, we can absolutely make choices that empower us to move forward. So, and this has been hard times. There's some beautiful research on the power of validation. Um, there was a study that was done with a couple of different groups that were trying to make significant lifestyle changes. And half of the group got um, cheerleading feedback. Rah, rah, you're doing great, keep going. The other half of the group got validating feedback. This is hard, it's a trudge, you can do it. The group that got validating feedback made significantly more and more significant lifestyle um, changes. So there is this really healthy thing about us taking a step back and saying, oh, deep breath, we've been through a lot. And these can be tough times. That validation can absolutely empower us forward. So that's partly what this is about. All right, you all. The best way to predict the future is to create it. So how do we do that? These are some of the fundamental ways that we can create joy in our work and create the conditions for others as well. So purpose is a really good place to start. Organizations that have an organizational sense of purpose perform incredibly better in terms of shareholder value and return on investments, return on assets, return on equity. In addition, Individual people are significantly happier, more joyful when we feel a sense of purpose. And so that is about three things. Purpose is about feeling like there's something bigger than myself out there somewhere that matters. Purpose is also about I can contribute to that in a meaningful way. I can make a unique contribution to that thing. And purpose is always about people. So we will absolutely sign up for 15% annualized growth. We are good corporate citizens, or we are good healthcare citizens, or we are good learning citizens. We will sign up for our company or our organization's requirements. But the thing that will get us out of bed in the morning is thinking about how we really affect people and communities. So that's partly what purpose is about. But here's the thing about purpose. We tend to think about purpose with a big giant capital P. Um, our daughter graduated from college in 2020. Our son graduated from high school in 2020. That was a bummer, right? Like, ah. Um, but before they each started college, we visited no less than 15 college campuses as a family for each of them. Like, these are kids who are very discerning, right? <laughs> so the thing that happened in every college recruiting session when we visited campuses was this is a place where you can come in order to change the world. 
This is the place that you can come in order to make a huge impact in the world. And that's really cool, because we all want to make an impact. But I thought, that's tons of pressure too, right? Like, if I got to wake up every day, no matter how old I am, whether I'm in college or a senior um, contributor at my organization, that's a ton of pressure. I have to change the world? I think the thing that we need to do differently in terms of purpose is thinking about what we do in a small way that we do well. There is this beautiful concept of ikigai. And uh, ikigai is a Japanese term which means your reason for waking up in the morning. So this is the Japanese grandmother who wakes up every morning so she can make soup for her family. So this is purpose, this is joy at work. This is when you wake up in the morning, what's the little thing you do? What's the soup that you make? And so it can be something very small. So part of happiness and joy is giving people a sense of how they matter and how their work com connects to others and reminding ourselves about that as well. The career implication then is that we want to prioritize what's important to us and we want to take the pressure off. Just wake up and do what you do best and know that you are absolutely contributing to your community. Does that make sense? All right, way cool. Another question for you. I'll read it all and then I'll come back. If you won the lottery, would you still work? A, absolutely, I would do exactly what I do today. I was born for it. B, yes and no, I might not do exactly what I do today, but I would certainly do volunteer work. C, no way, you would find me on an island somewhere. Or D, it depends, how many millions am I winning? <laughs> for those of you who are more, uh, more careful about your answers. All right, how many for A, you would do exactly what you do today? Oh, look at that. These are the people that you want to talk to on the break, right, in the networking. These are the people who are living their mission. So cool. So that was like maybe 9-ish, 10-ish percent of you. How about B? Yes and no, I would do something. I would volunteer, I would, oh, there we go. There's our huge percentage of most of you, cool. How about C, anybody toes in the sand? <laughs> a few, excellent, excellent, very good. We appreciate that. Anybody want to just know how much you're going to win before you're going to weigh in, <laughs> very good. All right, you're the, you are the smart ones, right? Okay, for those of you who, for those of you who said you would do something, I'm going to ask you to like uh, join in and say, what would you do? So give that a minute of thought. What would you do if you would do something? Here's why this is important. We all have an instinct to matter. This question has been asked in sociological research for 20 years, and globally, across genders, across countries, across age groups, people say, 93% of people say D or B. They say, I would do something. And so that demonstrates how much we all want to contribute to our community, how much we want to matter. And the smart people, too, on this answer say, you know, with remote work, I can have my toes in the sand and I can do my volunteer work. So <laughs> those are the people who are thinking, right? All right, all you bees, anybody, what would you do? Just give me a little popcorn thing. Anybody willing to speak up? What would you do? Volunteer at church. Yay, volunteer at church. Awesome. Who else? Same job, less hours, yes. Ken and I were talking about this, right? Sorry, Ken, that's another example of like, God, don't talk to the speaker. Um, yes, because part of what we love is flexibility and autonomy. And if we can do what we do with more of those, that's a big deal. That's how work is being reinvented right now too, right? Like that is the magic of hybrid. That is the magic of the wave that's happening right now. Who else? A couple other examples. What would you do if you weren't doing exactly what you do today? Anybody? Oh, go ahead, go ahead. I'd be a musician. Awesome, a musician. What kind of musician? Like, are you playing the clarinet? What? Folk music. Folk music. I love it. That's cool, you all. All right, so here's the cool thing about this. What was that over there? You want to hear her folk music? <laughs> Excellent. So we're going to look over the break. We're going to get to know you and understand. Yes, that's awesome. This is important because what you think that you would love to do when you're not being paid for it are wonderful clues about the elements of yourself, your talents, your capabilities that are most important for you to express in your paid work. And so that is a great reflection. Like, what do you love to do? And then how do you have more of that opportunity? Here's something very cool to know. 
You already know that if you're happy in your work, you will tend to perceive more happiness in your life all over the place. That is not rocket science. But here's something that you may not know. When you are happier outside of work, you perceive greater happiness inside of work. And so one of the ways to create joy and happiness in your work is to do stuff outside of work that you enjoy. So if you're playing at a folk festival, that can actually be really helpful to your work. If you're volunteering at church, that can actually be really helpful to your joy at work. So it's pretty cool that we have all these opportunities. So a word on identity. I've been thinking really hard about to what extent work should be part of your identity. Has anybody seen Top Gun Maverick? Oh, such a good movie, right? <laughs> Same movie from 30, exact same movie from 30 years ago, but a really good movie. And Tom Cruise, like, what is his skincare regime, right? <laughs> so um, anyway, oh, just sorry, I got distracted by Tom Cruise for a second. Um, <laughs> so there's this great line in that movie. He says, um, he's talking about like being a fighter pilot, right? And he says, it's not what I am, it's who I am. It was a great line, right? Like really cool. And so that's about identity. To what extent do we feel like our work is central to our identity? Um, on the one hand, it's really cool if we feel that alignment between what we love to do and what we get paid to do. On the other hand, we wouldn't want our identity to become overshadowing, right? Like we want lots of other elements of life that aren't about what we get paid to do. So I think this identity question is interesting, and you can give some more thought to that as well. One of the most significant contributors to bonding is surviving hard times together. Here is a word on connection and community. So in addition to purpose, one of the things that we can do to create the conditions for happiness is to connect with other people and to feel connected with our community. This one has giant neon blinking lights around it. We are wired to be connected with other people. When we feel connected with others, we get a hit of our feel-good chemicals in our brain. When we feel connected with others, the chemicals in our brain that are all about stress response tend to be tamped down. This is true for both introverts and extroverts. And here's something that's interesting. Friends at work absolutely start to fulfill you. And that can occur in superficial ways or in deeper ways. So there's some beautiful sociological research on um, uh, the superficial uh, conversations that we have with people, right? So you talk to somebody in the checkout line at Target or you, I don't know, you're getting gas and you chat with somebody and talk about, oh, the gas prices. Or you um, chat with the barista when you're grabbing your coffee. Those superficial interactions absolutely contribute to your happiness. And you think about how much of that you get at work, right? You're grabbing coffee and you chat with somebody. You see somebody in the hallway, elevator lobby, on Zoom, on Teams. Those matter. And friendship at work is utterly something that we experience because we can even go deeper. We get the chance to work with people over time and see them in lots of contexts. We get the chance to build uh, task trust and relationship trust. Task trust, I know you'll follow through and follow up. Relationship trust, I can let my hair down and know that you're a trustworthy listener. And so work tends to be a place where we can make those connections. And when we feel connected with our colleagues, that is a really big deal in terms of the level of happiness that we tend to feel. So the career implication here is connect as much as you can in meaningful ways. This is not about like how many LinkedIn connections do you have, right? Of course. This is about who are the people that you know, feel known by, feel appreciated by who you believe would take action for you. There's a lovely concept of PPR. It's a perceived partner responsiveness. And that is the dynamic where you feel like somebody gets you, you feel like they appreciate you, and you feel like they would take action for you. Those are the kinds of relationships that feed us most. And so we can, uh, we can think about creating those at work. Um, this is super interesting. I wrote an article about friendship at work not too long ago. That one, I think, was in Fast Company. I've written several on this topic. And it was on LinkedIn, and there was this giant debate that ensued about whether you should have friends at work or whether you should have more of a boundary. And there was a really interesting point that somebody made about whether it's friends at work or being friendly at work. Isn't that interesting? 
So I think it's probably both, right? It probably matters what you prefer and how deeply you want to go, and it absolutely matters how we show up. Sociologically speaking, the number one way that we learn is through watching other people, listening to other people, experiencing other people. And so how we show up has an incredible in influence on others, more than any of us even think. So if we show up in a as much as we can positive manner, even though we know every day isn't bonbons and butterflies, that's a really big deal for the people around us, and it's a really big deal for that idea of creating happiness and joy. 75% of people say that they make their best friends at work and their good friends at work, but here's something else. 81% of people say that they make their more diverse friends at work. Isn't that cool? In our personal lives, we might hang out, run into, see more people who look like us or sound like us or think like us. But at work, we may have more of an opportunity to connect with people who are different. And that is a beautiful thing because our lives have to some extent become echo chambers, right? The algorithms work way too well and we are mostly exposed to information that we already agree with or that we're already familiar with. But our innovation, our creative thinking, our sense of um, learning is absolutely built when we talk to people who are a lot different than what we are. And work can be a beautiful place to do that. Here's another question for you. In what ways have your relationship changed in the last couple years? A, I have greater quality and quantity of relationships. B, it's spotty. Some relationships have deepened and some have faded away. C, my circle has gotten a lot smaller, honestly. Or D, my best friends are the people in my Netflix shows. <laughs> or Top Gun, right? All right, A, how many more quality, more quantity? Wow, look at that. That's probably ish, 15%-ish. How about B, spotty? Lots of you. Yeah, cool. That's probably at least another 20% or so. How about anybody smaller circle? Yeah, so that's a good 5 7%. Anybody best friends on Netflix? So many good Netflix shows, right? This is a really interesting one. There was a national survey where people were asked about um, how they were reprioritizing based on the pandemic experience. And lots and lots of people said they were more highly prioritizing quality work, meaningful work, uh, friends, neighbors, community, adventure. More people wanted to skydive than ever before. Um, but one of the other interesting things is people said they were calling their friends. Not just their friend lists on Facebook or LinkedIn or whatever, but really being selective about the people they spent time with. Not in a bad way, but kind of in a good way. Like, I've got lots and lots of people I could spend time with, and there are certain people that I really want to make an investment with. So I think that's pretty cool, too. Purpose is critical to your happiness at work. So are connections, and so that is a very big deal. Gratitude is also huge. When we feel a greater sense of gratitude, we tend to feel much higher levels of happiness and joy in our lives. So this is about being intentional, waking up in the morning and thinking about what you're grateful for, going to bed at night, thinking about what you're, you're grateful for. And this is also about what you are grateful for. So um, I drive a 1979 VW Bug convertible, triple black. It's the coolest car ever. It's so awesome. I love to drive it. I am one with the road when I'm driving this high performance machine. My children think I love it way too much, and I probably do. That is an example of a thing, right, for which I am grateful. But the more meaningful things that we feel joy about will be the people around us, our situations, our capabilities. Those are the things that we want to focus on most. And here's a fun fact. If you spend money on acquiring things, you will gain much less joy and happiness than if you spend money um, uh, really experiencing things. And so those are great ways to invest our time. So the career implication here is to balance satisfaction with high expectations. I think this is an interesting dynamic tension. We want more. We want to do cool things. We want to reach, right? Those are really great parts of being humans and great parts of the way that we contribute to the world and to our work. And 
we want to just be present where we are and be appreciative of whatever it is that we have. Even if we don't live in the most wonderful job or the most wonderful organization in our lifetime, we can, be grati or we can have gratitude for certain things about it. And that is a very big runway to happiness and joy. Enjoy the little things, for one day you will realize they were the big things. Speaking as an empty nester, I can tell you that is so true. All right, you all. Another way that we can create the conditions for happiness is by performing as well as we can. We all have an instinct to matter. We want to know that our work matters. So this is about like finding what you do and then doing it as well as you can. And this also is about doing everything um, as well as you can. So you might be in a job where you're like, oh, this isn't quite right for me and I'm maybe not going to put everything into everything about this job. But when you perform really well, when you um, execute well on lots of different parts of your job, that builds credibility, but it also builds a sense of happiness and esteem. I also think there's an important point here about um, piloting and autopiloting. So pilots, when they fly, do not actively fly the plane the whole trip. I know this is a little scary when we first hear about this, right? They actively fly typically when they're taking off and typically when they're landing. But when they're just like flying over the country or flying over the world, that is when they typically use autopilot. And I think we can be selective about our work as well. There will be things that we want to do with utter excellence and with utter investment of time and energy. And there will be things that we will do really well, but we can be selective about how we invest our energy. Because they may not be the most important parts of our job, and we still want to do them well and perform well, but we don't have to be as high level in those kinds of things. So what about leadership? Lots of you in this room are leaders. Um, and I want to just talk for a second about whether you are responsible for other people's happiness. I have a strong opinion on this, which is always a little dangerous. There are most things I have strong opinions on, I guess. My husband would tell you that. Um, but I absolutely believe that we aren't necessarily responsible for other people's happiness. We are responsible for how we show up, and leaders model the way significantly. However, we are responsible to create the conditions for happiness, to influence for the conditions of, for happiness by giving people a sense of meaning, by aligning them in the job that seems best for them, by creating uh, situations where people can connect with coworkers. Those are really smart ways that leaders can make a big impact. And the other thing to know about leadership, did anybody see, is anybody old enough to have seen The Accidental Tourist, that movie? Oh, good. I'm so glad. So The Accidental Tourist was maybe not the best movie in the world, but I love the title, right? It was all about, um, and, and this, is, this is the part that relates to leadership. Leaders absolutely are modeling the way all the time. There tends to be a laser on leaders. People will overestimate the expressions they see, the words they hear, the things that they are understanding from leaders and believe it's about them or about the organization. It's just our human nature to do that. That's the leadership laser. But leaders are also accidental tourists. Because even if you don't mean to be all that, even if you're not trying to be an example for everybody, you kind of are. Because people tend to overestimate the importance of leaders' behavior. And so the way you show up and the way that you create conditions for others, the way that you express your own joy, whatever that looks like for you, are important to the organization and the culture. To what extent has your personal or leadership style changed? A, a ton, I feel like things are very different today for me. B, somewhat, I feel like I'm the same with some evolution. C, not a bit, I haven't changed at all. Or D, you'll have to ask my coworkers about this one. How many for A? Ah, good, maybe about 10% of you. How about B, anybody, some, little, ooh, big majority. How about C, not a bit, I haven't changed at all. Ooh, we've got a couple of you, wonderful. You are the people who wanted to know how much you're winning in the lottery too, I bet. All right, um, anybody, D, ask my coworkers? All right. This is interesting to reflect on because we've had a moment to reset and lots of us have kind of reimagined who we are and we can be validated in that style. So this is the last thing. We create the conditions for happiness significantly when we learn and grow and stretch. This is one of the things that a lot of people aren't aware of, which I think is so interesting. When we are sweating, either literally or figuratively, we tend to be more joyful, tend to be more happy. 
when we don't have it all figured out, when we are struggling, when we are challenged, when we are solving a tough problem, that is absolutely correlated with joy and happiness. For a couple of reasons, partly learning and stretch and growth are correlated with happiness because you are doing it with other people. Like a really hard problem is generally not something you're solving on your own. You're generally rolling up sleeves with others and that loops us back to the conversation about connection. In addition, when you're solving hard problems and really struggling with something, you are reminded of your own capabilities. You're validated in, huh, I gotta work hard for this. So this is interesting. When you are stretching and sweating and trying something new and challenging, you may not be guaranteed success, but you are definitely guaranteed learning. Because whether you succeed or whether you fail, you can reflect on what went well and what went less well, and you can be reminded of the extent to which your capabilities are built, whether you succeeded or failed. There's also an 85% rule. When you fail 15% of the time, you will tend to keep coming back for more. If you fail more than 15% of the time, you'll be like, oh, maybe this isn't for me, right? Like this is me in ballet dancing, not gonna happen. If you fail less than 15%, you might be like, no, I kind of have this one. I'm kind of ready for the next challenge. So that 15% rule is kind of cool. When you think about volunteering for the project, taking the initiative, stepping up, uh, going for the next job, think about places where you're already qualified to some extent, but that you can stretch and grow as well. So the implication is take initiative and that will contribute to your joy and happiness. So these are the ways that we can create joy in our work. And this is a bonus moment for you. These are unexpected sources of joy. All of these are statistically based and evidence-based. So I'm here to tell you, you gotta take some naps on weekends. Any nappers out there? Yeah, me too. Oh, is there anything better than taking a nap on a Saturday afternoon? I think not. Um, if you get enough sleep, getting up earlier is a really good idea. If you're not getting enough sleep anyway, forget that. And you gotta eat your vegetables. Like, I am not your healthy eater. This is not your program on health. But there is a theory that when you have more carotenoids circulating in your blood, that will help you to feel happier. So lots of fun and interesting stats on happiness. All right, you all. It is amazing how a little tomorrow can make up for a whole lot of yesterday. So we are going off into the summer together. We are going off um, for the end of your program year. And we have an opportunity to create happiness for ourselves, to create the conditions for happiness for others. And this is our moment for a bright future. Even though we've been through so much, we can do so much now. We can reset and reimagine. So we have time for questions, but I will stop a moment and give you a pause. So thank you, thank you all. Thank you, thank you. There is a book for you on your way out, but don't leave yet because we do have some time for questions. Anyone questions to ask? Things you see differently? Things you want to debate? Go ahead. Superficial but beneficial, that is a quotable quote, I have to use that. So the question, like how do we deal, as employers, how do we deal with proximity? How do we give people a sense of being together even if they're hybrid? Okay, so this is really important and I love this, this question is a six million dollar question. I absolutely believe that your work ends up being kind of a center of gravity, like it can bring us together. And we know that when we are face to face, we make more significant deposits in our bank of social capital, in our bank of meaning. However, we can also create proximity when we are apart. Proximity is the number one determinant of relationships, sociologically speaking. When we see people more, when we are more familiar with them, we also tend to be more accepting. We tend to like things more and people more when we see them more. Um, there was a brilliant uh, PhD study that was done where uh, people had to collaborate with those who were across the campus of their work, across the nation, and across the globe. Their follow-up and follow-through was perfectly correlated with distance. They were best at follow-up and follow-through across campus, middle, middling with um, across the nation, and worst across the globe. The trick in the study is that everybody was sitting in conference rooms right next to each other. 
proximity is something we perceive. And so I think that's the takeaway message for us right now with hybrid. I think the more we can be face to face, the better. Or if we can some be face to face. If we can figure out like what are the key departments that need to work together and they'll be in the office together Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Or what are the key moments in the project at key gateways and we're gonna be in person for those. Or we decide that we're gonna be in person when we have sensitive conversations. Like we develop some protocols. But then two, I think we can develop a sense of proximity that we can build virtually as well. When we have more cameras on, when we have more contact, when we reach out to each other regularly, when we schedule one-on-ones lots, when we spend time in the beginning of a meeting and we're, you know, like chatting, right? It doesn't feel tasky, it doesn't feel like it's connected to results, but it's more important to do some of that chatty stuff. So those are some of the ways that we can create proximity, even if we're not in person. And I think it's a both and, like hybrid work. There was another question over here. Go ahead. I love that question. There was an amazing body of research on empathy. When leaders are perceived as being more empathetic, you get better innovation, engagement, productivity, and retention. It's incredible, the numbers on this. As a leader, I think, though, it can be kind of scary because you can say to yourself, um, oh, I am not a social worker, and I don't want to mess this up. So I think we can take the pressure off of ourselves to try to solve the problem for people. But I think we can be really pragmatic in saying, you know what, it's about asking, it's about tuning in and being attentive, um, noticing when somebody's going through something. It is about asking questions and then just taking cues from people, like how much do they want to talk about it. It is about um, providing resources, right? Like it's the EAP or the HR department or the um, support department in your organization being able to connect people with resources. The other thing you can do is just be present and accessible. Presence and accessibility is significantly correlated with positive organizational culture. And the other thing you can do, number five, is to connect teams and teammates together. When we feel that webbing and that netting, that level of connection absolutely contributes to our mental health and our joy and our happiness. And so those also help create the conditions. So I love the question. All right, you all, you are an on-time group. This is an on-time program. Reach out if you'd like. Thank you, thank you for having me. Thanks, Jody. Mm -hmm. Tracy, thank you. What a great message for us to kind of go off into the summer and to approach it with joy. Thank you for that today. Uh, as a reminder, Tracy did provide all of you with books this morning. If you uh, are interested in grabbing one of her books, they're on the tables just outside the room. A couple of things before we go. We do have the golf outing coming up this summer. It is filling up quickly, but we'd love to have you join us. It will be on August 17, and this year we'll be at the Ravine. So if you're interested, put your team together. You can register on our website. And finally, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't um, mention a big milestone for us today. Um, thinking about the culture that we have at work, I am privileged to work in a place that has absolute joy in the work that we do. And that is thanks um, incredibly to Jane Clark. And as many of you know, um, we're making a transition. This is probably, if I do my math, Jane's been to about 320 of uh, these wake up West Coast slash early bird breakfasts. Um, and this will be Jane's last um, early bird breakfast, Wake Up West Coast. And so would you join me in thanking Jane for her incredible work in our community? <laughs> this, community, this community has been incredibly blessed. Uh, by her leadership, and she has absolutely challenged us uh, to continue to lead with joy and to uh, be impactful in the work that we do. And so with that, I'll say thank you for joining us today. Thanks for being a part of the West Coast Chamber, and we'll see you all soon. Thank you.